Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, okay, I'm just going to conclude this session here just by telling uh, a short story, really, about climate change and two public meanings of climate change. Climate change is something that's talked about a lot in society uh, over the last 10, 20 years or so. But I'm just going to contrast two public meanings, one of them about um, scientific authority and then the other one, uh, a kind of a more mundane one, if you like, but a way that perhaps more people understand climate change, which is in relation to the weather. OK, so just a very brief bit of history um, about climate change and kind of how it came onto the public agenda. Um, a very good uh, paper written by uh, my boss, uh, Brigitte, and uh, Rusi Jaspal uh, highlights 1988 as a key year that climate change came onto the agenda. And even then, it was all about scientific authority. So we've got James Hansen in the top left corner here, who gave this very um, kind of memorable testimony to US Congress, uh, which led to this Guardian uh, headline about pollution threatening to scorch the earth. And this quickly was picked up by politicians, not just in the US, but in the UK. So here we've got Margaret Thatcher, who gave two or three key speeches about the danger of global warming and climate change and something that needed to be tackled. So already we've got this kind of intertwining of developing, um, the developing scientific evidence and increasing political interest. Now, fast forward a few years, and here we've got David Miliband, who at the time was Environment Secretary. And uh, on the publication of the um, United Nations report, the IPCC report, he talked about how this was another nail in the coffin of climate change deniers and representing authoritative picture and showing that the debate over the science is well and truly over. So we've got this kind of contrast here already that a politician is using scientific evidence um, to justify a political position, which he then moves on to in the second half there about um, urgently needing political commitment to take action. Um, but this kind of closing down of a debate is slightly kind of contrary, if you like, to what science is traditionally seen as a kind of a, an open forum and a kind of a inherently sceptical about its conclusions and that its conclusions are, are usually provisional. But this intertwining of scientific evidence and um, political interest is very much part of the story in, um, in climate change. So we've got the scientific evidence that is now settled in Miliband's view here. Therefore, we now need policy. And following that, and this kind of reached its pinnacle, if you like, in the UK uh, with the 2008 Climate Change Act, which um, had this, includes this legal requirement to cut UK carbon emissions uh, by 80% by 2050. And science is in the heart of this um, act. It talks about... Uh, it, it, the Act does not allow future UK governments to uh, row back on this commitment unless, in quotes, there is significant change in the scientific evidence. So science is right at the heart of legislation here. So at this point in 2008, we've got, um, we've got a, a situation where the science is apparently settled, um, the politics is settled, so there were only five MPs in... Uh, the entire Houses of Parliament that voted against this act. There was huge cross-party support. Um, and then we have a policy settled, um, various targets, but this 2051 being the kind of a signpost one. And this kind of feeds in a little bit to what Judith was saying about depoliticisation, if you like. Political, um, political debate has, has, has disappeared from the, uh, from, the, from the mainstream scene. And this policy in politics rests very firmly on scientific authority. So that's kind of like a, a kind of a bookmark in the story, if you like. But following this, um, despite this attempt to kind of say that the science was settled, um, dialogue has continued. Now, my um, project is about scepticism and climate science, which kind of has a, a small uh, role to play here because the... Um, a lot of this dialogue continued in climate sceptic uh, blogs, in, uh, mainly in online forums uh, in the UK. Didn't had been bubbling along all the time um, during this previous period, but hadn't really cut through into the mainstream. 
Uh, and in these spaces, they were very critical of this kind of intertwining of science and politics that we uh, saw in that David Miliband quote. And this, uh, my project in Making Science Public is going to be kind of looking at some of these, uh, some of these discussions in a bit more detail. But what did give the sceptic community a big boost was um, the, uh, what's become known as Climate Gate, um, the unauthorised release of various emails by climate scientists, um, as you can see, uh, uh, kind of a, a very a neutral take here by Fox News on this, uh, this particular scandal. Um, but this happened in late 2009, and uh, so it's the year following the Climate Change Act. And this really represented a threat to this public meaning of climate change and scientific authority. So for the first time, there was questions being asked about the practice of the, uh, the climate scientists and what they'd been saying in private, in emails, about um, their own work and the work, of, uh, or the work of colleagues. And this, this was a sufficiently big, big story to, to come out of the online forums and... and percolated into the mainstream media, uh, not just in newspapers, but also um, TV as well and radio. It was the lead, uh, lead story on the Today programme, etc. Now, there's a story that this had a, a significant effect on public attitudes to climate change. And uh, in a recent documentary about um, climate gate, Peter Kellner from YouGov directly um, linked uh, climate gate with increasing levels of scepticism and he says that has been persisting ever since but i'm i'm going to tell a bit of a different story here and wonder if some of these increased levels of public scepticism are in fact been something due to something a little bit more mundane and in fact greater scepticism about climate change and climate science has perhaps got something to do uh with the weather that we've been having so uh, this is not just me talking off the top of my head. Uh, this is some, uh, there's been some interesting uh, research come out in the last month or so uh, by Hamilton Stampone, uh, talking about how, this is in the US, beliefs of independent voters about climate change literally shift with the weather. So both in the last two or three days, but also in recent weeks, but their own personal experience of the weather in their area, okay? Not based on... Uh, highly complex uh, theories of climate science and their, um, and their decisions on them one way or the other. It's a little bit more mundane, if you like, than that. Now, if we actually look at the weather, so this is back in the UK, so um, this is uh, from 1910 to 2010, so you really want to be looking right at the end here. So this, these peaks here are in the late 2000s when... Um, we had Miliband talking and the Climate Change Act came in and we had very warm years in the UK. Uh, and then, but what was interesting is that coinciding with uh, climate gates and these increasing levels of public scepticism, we've got this huge drop off here, which you may or may not remember, but that was, that basically looked like this, um, which was the big freeze that happened uh, in January 2010, coldest winter for, for more than 20 years, uh, sub-zero temperatures for two weeks. Uh, a, frozen, a frozen Britain, as you can see here on this excellent satellite photo. Now, it's not that surprising that the public, uh, perhaps, uh, or publics understand climate change in a way that's slightly more everyday and mundane. I mean, after all, as is well documented, climate science is uh, about modelling very complex systems with advanced computer modelling. And crucially, uh, in terms of its effect on society, is its predictive aspect. So we're very much, it is based obviously on some data that we already have, that we've observed, but so much of it is based on extrapolating into the future about what the potential effects of climate change might be. And as we've already heard this morning, envisaging the future is something which means a lot of different things to different people, and it's hard to visualise. So rather than this intangible aspect, we end up with so much discussion of climate change uh, in the media revolving around recent weather. And this is on both sides of the debate. So we've had um, discussions about Australian wildfires and how they might be related to climate change. 
Uh, we had Boris Johnson musing in the Daily Telegraph about how uh, when he looked out the window it looked a bit cold, therefore perhaps climate change wasn't all it's cracked up to be. Um, and then also in the US as well, which has kind of, for me, kind of started this interest off, we had this, the, the idea about Hurricane Sandy and how this was very um, explicitly linked to climate change in the media. In fact, this cartoon even says, this is what climate change looks like. It's like this is a kind of searching round for something that we can hang climate change on as an idea. But the science linking Sandy to uh, climate change is, is certainly pretty, pretty weak. This, in the, kind of, uh, the realm of extreme weather events you can have, hurricanes are pretty low down the, uh, pretty low down the table on what you can link to climate change. <coughs> Uh, and just kind of, and you can contrast these two public meanings uh, of climate change very well here. So on the left here, you've got this uh, description of Hurricane Sandy and climate change, full of caveats. While the hurricane was not directly attributable to global warming, scientists said it fits a pattern of more severe weather influenced by climate change. So this is scientifically uh, fairly, perhaps accurate, fairly literal, but it doesn't perhaps mean that much to people. Uh, reading it who are just kind of looking for some everyday information but this is very much a scientific authority view whereas perhaps this is a more kind of uh, public understanding view that we had on the front of Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, much criticised, much circulated but um, uh, something that you know explicitly links climate change to the weather for better or worse. So just to wrap up, what might this mean, this idea of weather as a public meaning of climate? So I've just picked out three kind of political uh, ideas here that might come out of this. So it may, it may well shape research. So people are very aware that people uh, link weather to climate change. So will this shape research uh, agendas, looking more, more research trying to link particular weather events to climate change to, to help prove that climate change is a problem? Does it suggest diminished scientific authority in the public sphere? So this might be quite difficult for climate scientists to, uh, to accept, if you like, the fact that even though they're doing all this great work on, on advanced modelling, uh, this uh, highly advanced agenda, to the majority of people in the public, it just doesn't mean that much. And they understand this, this idea of climate change, which is kind of now loose in society, if you like, in a very different way. And finally, a more kind of explicitly political uh, aspect, if you like, perhaps advocates of climate policy, clean energy, etc., should not rely on the science as justification for their policy preferences. So if we have this situation where perhaps scientific authority is not what it's cracked up to be in society, perhaps uh, policy advocates need to look elsewhere, or certainly in places in addition to science, to justify what they want to do. Thank you.